Welcome to everybody on the webinar and I apologize for the slight delay in starting. Uh, thank you for waiting patiently. Um, we think we had an access issue or we might have been erased, excuse the pun. I'm Robert Bond, uh, I'm a partner with Bristow's uh, and today we are going to be talking about subject access requests um, and I'm going to take us through the uh, presenters for today. Um, and me, you know, uh, you've heard me before, I am in the data protection team at Bristow's and I also chair the governance board of the data protection network, uh, which is co-hosting this webinar with us today. Uh, I'm also joined by Phil, Phil Dunn, um, who is an associate with OPT4. Uh, Phil helps manage a lot of the organization of DPN, so we're delighted that Phil uh, is not sitting in the background today, but is sitting round the table. Uh, and like the other speakers, uh, Philippa, Phil has a lot of experience in data protection compliance, uh, and particularly dealing with uh, data subject requests. We're also joined by Sarah House. Um, Sarah is the recently appointed UK Data Protection Officer for CGI IT Limited uh, and uh, has had many, many years in-house uh, in advising on data protection. Uh, as you can see from the slide, she was heavily involved in GDPR project implementations. She was five years in Haymarket's uh, Asia office. Uh, and again, brings a wealth of expertise in relation to data subject access requests. And finally, Simon Hall. Uh, Simon uh, is uh, now a freelance privacy consultant. Um, he and I first knew each other when he was with IBM, uh, and he has been in-house with a, a number of large organizations and then uh, consultancies and again brings a wealth of experience in terms of data protection and data subject access requests. Um, and so without further ado, we are gonna take ourselves into access, portability, profiling, etc. I just put up on the screen here, uh, what are the relevant individual rights under GDPR um, and one is the right of information, why we have our privacy notices and fair processing statements, and then moving round the right of access uh, or subject access rights. We mustn't forget the right of rectification, uh, nor must we forget the right of erasure or the right to be forgotten. And indeed, we may well touch on erasure uh, because we've had questions in on that. There's also rights of restriction of processing. There's the right of portability. There is a possibility that we'll talk about portability, uh, but the thrust of today is uh, subject access. There's the right to object to processing, particularly where there may have been a lawful ground of processing, for example, of legitimate interest. And then finally, there is the right to understand automated decision-making or profiling. Uh, these are the ones that we most think about, but I also wanted to remind us, uh, moving to the next slide, that let's not forget GDPR says there are also rights for the individual to complain to the regulator, uh, the right for judicial remedy, uh, the right to have representation in making claims, and the right to compensation. So there are a lot more rights under GDPR than we had under the old directive. Um, what we're gonna be doing in the next 45 to 50 minutes is, as I say, to look particularly at subject access requests. For those that are on the webinar, uh, this will be recorded and the recording will be available in a few days time after we have finished the webinar, uh, both through the DPN network and also on the Bristow's website. And of course, please do send your questions in using the question box as we go through. I wanted to explain that the way we're doing this round table, uh, 
uh, today is that many of you kindly filled in questions when you registered. And we have bundled those questions into logical groups. And so we're going to spend more time answering your questions than trying to tell you uh, the answer as to what the law says. Uh, we think that there are plenty of good steps that can be taken, but we think that uh, as uh, we were talking before we went live, the answer to many of the questions will be, it depends. So to talk about subject access requests, I wanted to just remind us of a few principles. Um, the requirement uh, is that controllers must provide the data subject with information um, when a request is put in without undue delay and at least within one month. And remember, that's not working days, that's calendar day. It can be extended to two months if it's necessary, depending on the complexity of the request or the number of requests. And you can't charge, not unless it becomes uh, vexatious or it's proportionately necessary. And I think most of us that deal with SARS recognize the more you try to extend the deadline, the more you try to suggest you're going to charge, the more that the, the individual be, will be unhappy. And I think that more the ICO will raise an eyebrow about your process or even your, your lack of preparation to respond to a SAR. What also is a SAR? Let's just look <coughs> at the next uh, slide. Um, it's a right for the individual to understand what information an organization holds about them. It is not a backdoor means of e-discovery. And yet, in fact, we find that it is. And many requests that we see come in are designed to try and get hold of not information necessarily, but documents. And it isn't all about documents. And yet we see individuals that believe it is. Um, so we need to understand that when we receive a subject access request we have to respond to the individual's rights knowing that the individual is generally not a happy person and will be less and less unhappy the more and more barriers we put up and i think the issue that we've all seen in responding to sars in the current world is that data does not sit in one place and it becomes massively difficult to identify the individuals. So I've also, before we get into our first lot of questions, put up a few more reminders here. So what are the first steps? Identify the request. Um, identify the identity of the individual. Make sure you have a system where you log and report it internally. Check if you need other formalities. Acknowledge receipt, and if you need to request other information, do. And make sure you diarize your deadline, particularly where you have multiple subject access requests. This is a <coughs> big process. Um, moving on. Think about um, identity. So in terms of identity, we had a number of questions, which we put on the slide here. Is proof of identity always required? What's reasonable and appropriate proof of identity? Uh, once we've had the proof of identity, uh, should we destroy it uh, following the request? Um, what do we think, Sarah? Um, as, as it says on the notes, it has to be proportional. Um, you can receive a subject access request from a member of staff through your corporate email system it's obvious that you know who that person is. The last thing you want to do is go back and say, prove it. However, you can receive a DSAR via a tweet or some other form of social media. And at that stage, you definitely do need to go back and try and work out who on earth this is, particularly if they've got a, a fairly popular surname. Um, so yeah, it's, it's down to who it is that's asking, whether you already know who they are or whether you feel that you have to you know, and, and you have a justifiable cause to ask them to prove that they are who they are. That's fair. I also think it's it's very much looking at what information you'd be providing. So, you know, if you're going to be providing highly sensitive information, financial records, medical details, what are you going to have to put 
rigorous checks in place to make sure that's going to the right person. And you're going to want to ask for good, you know, identity, you know, proof of their identity. But if you, if it's actually the information you've got is not particularly sensitive, it may be that you can call them up and just ask them a couple of questions based on what you already know about them and ask them to confirm that. So it can be, it, it's very dependent on what you're going to be disclosing. Okay, uh, Simon. I think if I just add to, um, uh, to that, um, there's a lot of preparation you can do in advance because uh, as Robert said earlier, the answer to most of these questions is it depends. Um, in this case, it depends very much on the, uh, the nature of your relationship with the data subjects uh, and the sort of data, uh, as, as Phil has just suggested, the sort of data you're processing. Um, so for example, a, uh, a retailer with an online uh, account, the customer um, sends in an email using the email which is registered on the account, uh, requesting the information to be sent by post to the postal address on the account. Um, it would seem uh, probably unnecessary to, uh, uh, to, to, to in those circumstances, um, <clears throat> to have any requirement at all for um, uh, seeking proof of identity. Uh, obviously, if, if requests come in via a tweet or some other reason, uh, some other um, um, method, then clearly it is uh, not only wise; it's actually essential because um, what we really have to do here, uh, what all organisations really need to do is start off by uh, assessing the risk. You need to identify what risks there are to the individual of getting it wrong. So not only are the risks of, um, which of course we all think of first, what's the risk of a fine or, or a slap on the wrist um, from the regulator uh, if, we, if we don't fulfill this properly, um, but what are, what are the actual uh, uh, risks to the individual if we send a whole bunch of their data off to somebody who isn't them, who isn't authorized uh, by them to receive it? So um, again, depending on the nature of your organization, the nature of your relationship with your individuals, uh, look at the risk of fraud, look at the risk of error. A classic example, um, it's, it's almost, you couldn't make it up. Um, calling a house, uh, asking for the, an individual to confirm their name, first name, last name, address, and date of birth, and finding there were twins with almost identical first names twice in one month within uh, after the 25th of May. So uh, that's an extreme, obviously, but assess the risk of error um, and then uh, assess the risk of excessive um, collection and retention of, uh, of, the, of the information you're seeking for that um, uh, uh, proof of identity. So, so that was actually one of the other questions that we had is, is if you decide reasonably that you want to get I don't know, a copy of the ID card or the passport of the individual to verify the, the signature, map, all the good things you would do. Do you think there's a, there's a reasonable period for keeping that proof of identity? Um, mm, well, well not Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trick we, question, we, sorry. we may not all necessarily <laughs> agree in this room. Let's just put that one in first. Um, what I do is I log what the form of identity was. I do not keep a copy of it once I've actually fulfilled the DSAR. Yeah, and I think that's a yeah. good proportionate yeah. Yeah. way of dealing with it. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to the next slide where we've got a couple of other interesting questions. How do you spot malicious or phishing requests? Um, and how, how much can you push back? Uh, Simon? Uh, I think it's how much you, you you must push back rather than how much you uh, you can push back. Um, if having assessed the risk, you've decided that uh, in the nature of your business, nature of the relationship is such that uh, there is a risk of of, um, of phishing, then um, you owe it to your data subjects to go to um, proportionate extent to establish their um, uh, their identity. And of course, um, even though as you suggested earlier, your, your average person submitting a request. Is probably not happy in the first place. Um, I, I think most of them will understand uh, the value to them of your taking taking the identification uh, validation seriously. And then, and then the other one up there, just out of interest, and Phil, what do you do about a verbal request that's come into the switchboard, etc.? I think this is really interesting because it's something new that's come. It always used to had to be that it was a written request, um, and I think it's it's interesting because. Yes, it could come to anywhere in the business. Does somebody remember to write it down? I've heard of three cases recently where somebody is claiming that they requested something verbally to a companies and the company's going, we've got no record. They can't, nobody, and, and so 
I would say that, yes, of course you're going to take a request verbally over the phone. You've got to train staff to ensure that they know that this can be requested verbally, but I would get written confirmation as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, Phil's point spot on, making sure that everybody who could possibly be approached for a DSAR <coughs> has been trained, and that includes people in your post room, people on your switchboards, people who are out there as salespeople. Um, I mean, we, we had one come in the other day, um, and I wasn't sure whether it was phishing or not. It, it was set up as coming through from an organization called Deceit Me, which I hadn't heard of, um, but I Googled it, had a look, um, and my first response there was to send a very bland email to the person who it looked as though it had come from, which was via a Hotmail account, to even see if this was a legitimate um, request it, because it hadn't flagged up on our phishing system. Um, and she confirmed that, yes, it was. And thank you very much. Yes, yeah, she'd like to go ahead with it. But it, it's one of these systems where apparently you can now go online, fill in a whole raft of organizations, press a button, and we'll all get a decent request. Yeah. OK, so let's just move on to the next slide, because I wanted to remind those of us on the webinar that you have got a lot to search and it's still not all about what's on the system, it's about what's in the bottom drawer, it's about the manual files um, and you know my war story is sitting around with some clients where HR directors said we manage, we manage staff records and interviews and so on impeccably, it's all on, on the system because everybody has a laptop, everybody goes to the interview, uh, we control it. And then one of the business managers says, but I still print off CVs and bios. And I said, and what do you do with them after the job interview, whether or not you've given the person the job? And he goes, oh, I've got a bottom drawer with about two years worth of CVs and bios and so on. And, you know, there is the faces all drop, et cetera. And that is deeply scary now that it's not all on our system and it's not all in the bottom drawer, it's on personal devices that may not even be controlled by the business. So again, the young lady in HR who decided to take photographs on her personal device of the ID and the proof of address with a view to downloading them later, and never did. And so you, you really do have to train and have processes in place to manage all this stuff. So I thought it was worthwhile just flagging up where we need to be doing our searches and so on. And so back to the questions which we received. Um, <clears throat> yes, what kind of things are related to or are obviously about the individual? How, how far do you have to go in terms of pulling up statements, points of views, etc.? Any thoughts? I guess my, my quick summary when I'm trying to explain it to people is it's to me, from me, and about me. So it's going to include photographs, videos, telephone transcripts, attachments. Um, or audio recordings, yeah, like the question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, CCTV. All sorts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you talked about things in bottom drawers and on people's iPhones. Um, one of the things that we found useful is to sit in amongst teams and say, talk us through your process, what do you actually do? And recruitment is a, is a real doozy. Um, when you start finding out that, um, oh, well, we, we have things called loose lists, which is another lovely source of data. And almost every finance department and HR department will have loose lists somewhere. You just have to ask the right questions. Okay. I was going to say in uh, profiling, um, the number of organizations that profile uh, consumers um, uh, is growing all the time and the amount of data that they've been collecting, I, I think they've probably been deleting quite a lot of it recently, but uh, certainly uh, there, there are significant volumes of data. Um, that, that some calculations I did over a year ago would estimate that, uh, that the average um, e-commerce organization would have the equivalent of a novel, which is apparently 297 pages. Um, of, of data on, on their average customers. Uh, so, so, so what is it? What is it about? When you actually start getting into the nitty gritty of, of um, profound database and you find all the all the flags, um, the, uh, the 
whether they have children, ages of children, uh, income brackets, whether we think they're affluent, whether, they, whether we think they're just mm -hmm. getting by. Um, all, all this information is personal information, it's about them, and it can be quite challenging to uh, distill that into uh, useful, readable, intelligible information for those uh, consumers. You can't just print off a copy of the uh, database printout because it's just a whole lot of uh, squiggles and letters and ticks. And in a way that sort of leads on to the second set of questions we've got here, which are all about emails. Um, do you have to supply all emails? Do you need to include emails even if the individual is just CC'd? How do you handle large volumes? Um, my comment from the sort of moderator position here is, of course, this presumes that it's all about handing over documents. Mm -hmm. And yet it isn't. You may have to, I'm assuming, go through thousands and thousands of emails to identify where the individual is, but you don't have to deliver every single email. True, isn't it? I mean, I, guess, Phil? I, guess, I would say, you know, if you're a recipient of an email, you're CC'd in an email, it's part of your routine. Say it's an employee, ex employee who submitted the, submitted the um, uh, request. The, the, the email, your email address may be in thousands of email addresses, e email sort of correspondence, but that doesn't make the contents of that email about you. And I would say it's more about the content of the email. You're processing their email address, you're processing their, their, their name, but is the content of the email about them? Is it relating to, does it identify them? Does it, you know, have consequences for them? This information that's in there. So if, if I had, you know, somebody sends me an email and it says, hi, Phil, can you send an invoice to this client? Well, you know, yes, it's got my name. Yes, it's got my email address. But does the content of the email mean anything? But if that email was between two people and they're saying, oh, um, John is really failing to meet his sales targets and we think he needs extra training. Well, then suddenly the content of the email is related mm. to the individual. And there's the challenge. Uh, getting from the 30, 40, 50, 60,000 emails uh, that contain uh, an email address, which and, and the personal information that can be covered just in the covering letter saying we also uh, obviously have copies of your uh, contact details on the emails you've sent and received uh, while you've been here. Um, and you don't need to go any further than that. Uh, but it's finding the letters, finding the emails that are actually uh, contain information about the individual. Uh, one thing that's quite helpful there is to ask if you get a request for all the information is to uh, to go back and sort of, uh, to go back to the uh, individual and ask are there any particular periods, any particular events, or any particular people. So what you try and do is start closing off and cutting off big chunks. So uh, and there's something we can actually do. Uh, without necessarily going back to them, we can do some proactive work here by going to HR and finding out if they've been involved in any um, uh, dis any disputes at all with the organisation, grievances, disciplinaries, uh, whether they've been under consideration for uh, redundancy or any other matters like that, uh, sick leave, all these sort of things, um, and we can we can start pinpointing in, um, uh, times that that, uh, that 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 we need to start searching in while we're going to get further information if we can get them to distill it. Yes, I mean obviously remembering that. They don't have to narrow it down, which is quite frustrating. Although I'm, I've seen since GDPR, I've seen because I think there's a some very standard SAR language out there. People actually saying, "I want to look in the HR files between X, Y, you know, dates." And you think actually that's really useful because mm. at least we have narrowed it down rather than I want to know everything about everything. Um, one of the other. I guess one of the other things that comes out of these questions is, is that if we don't have to produce the exact document, um, but we do have to extrapolate what's your personal data, who it was being shared with, how long we keep it for, and what was the intent expressed about you. I wondered, Sarah, from your experience, have you ended up having to go back to members of staff and train them not to say certain things in writing because it's, you know, you wish with hindsight, I wish you hadn't said that. Yes, it's the answer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things, um, 
I, I think we're caught, caught slightly between a rock and a hard place. I think often the reason why we disgorge the amount of information that we have is because we don't necessarily have a tool that makes narrowing it down or editing it easy. And so I think it is just a data dump, for want of a better phrase. Um, but yes, to your point, Robert, training in this is very important, particularly with people like the HR team, because they're often um, the first line of the first port of call, um, that particularly that your staff will go to or ex-members of staff. Um, and I, I think it's like all sort of legal discussions, less is more. You don't offer anything that you don't need to offer. Don't express any opinions that you don't need to make. Keep everything extremely um, polite, extremely disciplined, and if necessary, get them to ask you to eyeball it before they send anything out, if they're just not sure. Um, I think there is a degree of panic with a lot of people when they receive a DSAR, particularly the first few, uh, where they kind of go, oh, you know, give them everything um, and let's just get it over and done with and out by the end of the first month. And I'm not suggesting you wait until day 29, but it's like a lot of situations where it's worth editing things down, sleeping on it, and then, um, you know, thinking about it twice, maybe getting it eyeballed by a colleague mm -hmm. before it goes out. Yes. So again, war stories. I, I remember getting asked, live to advise on a situation where the individual was at the counter serving under the old law of section 7 SAR to know about her late mother and the brother and her and what they were entitled to under a will etc and before we'd even got to talk about whether dead people are covered by this mm. um, the clerk had handed the entire file over mm. everything in nothing redacted, et cetera, et cetera, with, with the first item in the file talking about the lady serving the request, saying this is the most revolting woman I have ever dealt with. Oh, yeah. And you know that the unhappy person is going to win. Mm. Because there's a data breach as well. Because to your point, you've got to think about who are we handing this over to? Are mm. we handing stuff over we shouldn't be handing exactly. over, et cetera. Yeah. And so there's a lot of thinking about before you even deliver it. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, what do we do when the request doesn't come from the individual themselves? So, Phil, what if it comes in from I am the lawyer representing Mr. So-and-so, etc.? Essentially, you want to make sure that you've got evidence that they've got the authority to act on behalf of the data subject. Mm. And sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say, whilst we're on DSARS, Section 29 requests, that's another one where I've seen people receive an email from the police and go, well, it's the police. Yeah. We help the police. Yeah. We're going to give them everything. Yeah. And it's like, no, are you even sure it's the police? Have you checked it's a police officer? Have you got the right paperwork? What are the confines of that request? And, and back to your other point, um, you know, we, we have a right to protect all the third parties. Yes. Yes. We can't just say... Yeah, Mrs. Bloggins bought this car off Mr. Smith and Mr. Smith is living with Miss Jones and she also advertised this car mm. and that car. Mm. Which, is, which, of course, when you, when you have an individual that thinks they're going to get documents or you've never dealt with a SAR before and you start trying to redact, that can become a massive exercise that makes absolutely no sense of what you then hand over to the individual. Mm. And I know we're going to get to this a bit later on, so one of the things that I think as you get more experience, is finding better ways of delivering the result of the request, mm -hmm. where you deliver it in a format that makes sense, et cetera. Um, but let, let's come back to that one. We also got on here, which I think is a really interesting one, is how do you handle requests from parents for children's data? And I can imagine, well, it, it is a problem when you are a school, and you have got two parents that are warring with each other and you question again, is this genuinely a subject access request and how do you go about this? I mean, I, you know, Simon. I, I think the first thing is it's not just um, warring parents. There's also this, this, the whole area of children's data is fraught with risk. Um, and organizations that hold a lot of data about children are obviously vulnerable to attacks from um, 
uh, from people who, who would do harm to those children, um, uh, quite apart from uh, estranged parents. So I think uh, there are two steps. First of all, you've got to identify, uh, you've got to verify the identity um, um, in a very, very clear and documented way. And you've got to keep um, very, very clear records. Um, and then uh, to, to address your point, have to ensure that the individual who's the parent that's requesting is actually authorised to receive it, because there could be all sorts of, uh, sort of banning orders. And, and, so and ha again, the ICA has talked about children are data subjects. Yeah. How, how, what, how would you, Sarah, assess the child's ability to actually understand the request they're making? Yeah, discuss. Um, <laughs> I mean, we're, I'm very fortunate, the organisation I work for, when I said to them, do we handle any children's data, said, no, nothing at all. And I said, didn't I see somewhere that we've got to bring your child to work day? Oh, yeah, um, mm -hmm. right. And don't we bring in uh, work experience people who are 14 and 15? Oh, yeah, yeah, we do that as well. So I think you can be in an organisation where you kind of think, not my problem and then suddenly discover that you do need to think about, well, who's going to sign that form? Are you planning on videoing this uh, hackathon that you're going to run? What rights do you want to give to share that? Um, if you're going to pop it up on the corporate website, uh, are we okay with that? Um, and I think for, and, for, for you know, even before you get into the health and safety insurance, right, that sort right. of side of, and, and who's got a nut allergy, um, yeah, you can't assume that it's not going to come and you know impact on you at some point. Okay, let's let's move to um, other questions. Um, should you always ask for consent when third party inextricably linked to the information is being provided? Um, I go on, oh, sorry, go on, Phil. Sometimes, if you can. If it's practical to, um, if um, but I think there are occasions where that may not be possible. I think there are occasions when that risks identifying the person making the request. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's a challenge and it's a balance. Um, with all of these things, it's a balance, isn't it? But you know, you you need to make sure if it's practical to ask for consent, ask for consent. There's also, and then aren't you got to, you know, if they somebody's refused consent or it wasn't practical to ask for consent, then you've got to consider, is it reasonable to disclose this information about a third party without consent? Um, an example you might have is, you know, there might be emails that include is an employee's access request. There might be emails that contain, sorry, emails that contain information about third parties that are in the workplace. All these individuals were known to the requester. All of them know each other really there's not much risk and do we need to ask every single person for their consent? You might say, look, it's reasonable in these circumstances, in the context of this request, to disclose this information. It's just their, their work email addresses. Or other organisations might say, no, we're going to redact all of that. Yes. Um, and, and I think it's really important in this to, to, you know, you've got to look at, it's there in Article 15. You, you sh should not comply with an access request if it adversely affects the mm -hmm. rights of others. Yes. And if you believe that the information that you are going to disclose, even if you redact it and try and anonymise it, could identify a third party that would not want this information to be disclosed and mm. it could have an adverse effect on them, you've got to really carefully consider what you're going to do and document whatever decision you take. Yeah, I think document... Yeah. Mm. is really important because you've, I mean, the way I always look at it, the jaundiced lawyer's point of view is what, look at what's the worst that's going to happen and then work back from that. Um, and usually you learn that the hard way anyway. <laughs> so, yes, sorry, I'm silent. Yeah, yeah I, I think there's a, I absolutely agree with everything Bill said. Um, I think there's a, a second level of complexity and challenge here, and that's around um, the legal basis for disclosing that information because if you go for consent, Go for it once. Basically, you've got to stick your colours to the mast. You, once you've chosen your legal basis for uh, this type of disclosure, then you're kind of stuck with it. Mm. And the thing about consent is you have to explain the right uh, and, and grant the right to withdraw consent. Mm. So if your policy, for example, I, I've just jotted down two, two um, examples of uh, where these will typically arise. Employee witness statements in disciplinary actions. Um, I've actually... 
had ICO guide, direct ICO guidance on this, um, where the, the guidance was to summarize the, uh, uh, the personal information contained in those witness statements uh, as much as possible to, if you like, be fair to both, both sides. Um, and the other is uh, call center, co uh, contact center, uh, call recordings. So every call recording has the personal information of the, uh, of the agent, uh, if it's only their, their voice. So um, the question is, do we try and get everyone's consent? Clearly not. Um, so it, it's important uh, that we sort of take a step back, really think this through from beginning to end, make sure that uh, the privacy notice to employees, especially if you work in a contact center, is that your, uh, your voice may be recorded and may be disclosed to and so on. Um, so do we always need to get consent? No, but I, I'm saying no, just at that very, very general level. Mm. There will clearly be situations uh, which are much more specific, where absolutely you're going to have to get consent or simply not disclose it. Okay, and just before we move on, um, there's two or three questions come in, uh, and in fact I know we've had more, and one of them I'm going to park to the end, but I just wanted to tackle um, this one, because a little earlier we were talking about how you identify the individual making the request and what is reasonable, and the questions come in, does the clock stop ticking when you request ID in terms of the 30 days? Phil. Well, the ICO guidance that we've recently had out says that the, the clock starts ticking the moment you have got proof of identity. So, but that doesn't mean that you can sit there and delay and you've had an email in requesting um, uh, subject access and you've left that for two weeks before you've asked them for their identity so I think but they do they're saying the ICO guidance is clear that it would start from once you've received the proof of identity or the additional information that you've requested say it was asking for the you know the scope whether they you know specific scope for the for the request but I think you would have to be proportionate with it. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. okay so there's two there's two that are sort of linked, which is around um, deletion. So um, one question we've had is, we the business has a regular process of deleting or overwriting, overwriting data. Um, when we receive a SAR, how is that affected in terms of the, do we have to stop the deletion, et cetera? And then the other one we've had in is that in our business, one division has a process of regularly deleting and overwriting, but another division does not. Does that mean that we still have to go and search across the entity? And so the two similarly related, and I can see the raised eyebrows from the first question. So Phil, what happens when you receive a SAR? Or a DSA. If you have got routine processes that are operating that, that would happen regardless, then you would provide the information as it is at the end, as you when you provide it. But you can't go in and actually change anything. But if it's part, I believe that if it's part of your routine processes that would happen, and certainly I think the ICO guidance on this is that if that you would provide the information at the point that what you have at the point that you mm -hmm. provide that information. So it may be that a deletion process happened whereby that information was deleted between the time that you, the request came in and, and you supplied that information. And certainly that's what the ICOs take on it in their guidance is, mm -hmm. is that, but obviously it's a criminal offence to go in and amend or rectify anything yeah, because, that wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. by due process. Because we talk about as a litigator, there's litigation hold the moment you receive the SAR, so you can't touch anything. Right. Um, uh, which is which is interesting when you do have the well look the system overwrites and you think about stuff that is on tweets and other products where you know after a period of time mm. beyond your control it yeah. is overwritten. I think it, it's yeah. a tricky one there. But again, what's the worst? I would be saying, you know, we need to have an answer for this. Mm. Like in all of these things, we need yeah. to justify the stance that we took. We, we, we've, um, I, I worked with an organization which, which came across this uh, on a regular basis um, over, over, well, and continues. Uh, it's around CCTV. 
uh, people requesting CCTV. Uh, and it really comes down to common sense and a, uh, a good moral compass. So a request comes in, yes, you may have to um, uh, verify um, uh, the, the identity, you may not, but if you do, that is not a reason uh, for later saying, oh, so no, by the time you sent your proof of identity in, uh, it had been deleted. I think when the request comes in, the right applies to information you've got. You've got it, if you have it that day, you have it and you keep it, you store it, you save it. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't, no, of course, you, uh, I think somewhere in GDPR it says um, you don't have to keep information, retain information just in order to fulfill yeah. um, uh, the request. So, so the other one that we had in earlier is, is if we've received a data subject access request and within a few days we receive from the data subject a request to erase, which takes precedence. And yeah, interesting. Yeah. And I, I had I had this one, and talking it through with the client, we we suspected we realised the reason why the HR file now needed to be deleted because of things which were on the file which might have affected the individual's position in some other uh, litigation or whatever. But when you look at it, if there's a litigation hold when you receive the subject access request, until the SAR is satisfied, the right of erasure by the individual cannot overwrite it, in my view. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that was what we went back to the individual and said, is, is that whilst the SAR is in process, and indeed beyond the 30 days, you might still not want to erase because the individual might complain to the ICO, you might be asked to add further information. So genuinely, I think, although I take Phil's point about the automatic deletion in a process, I think you've got a problem if you don't across the organization when the SAR arrives, say, we have to not, we have to freeze what we've got. Yeah. I, I think there's an element which simplifies or, or reduces the, the scale and scope of that, uh, that, that challenge, and that's that, um, is interesting when you start looking at rights of erasure but people think they have a right to have a lot of people think they have a right to have all their data deleted um but of course uh when you when you look at those uh sort of five heads uh they were i believe they were all in the the old data protection um directive uh so nothing's actually changed it's just the perception uh and because so much especially hr data because so much of it is processed on the basis of uh, either legal requirement or um uh just legitimate interest so little is under consent um, and hopefully very little will have been retained beyond, uh, so no, no longer has a legal basis. Um, there probably isn't actually very, a, a conflict at all, except in respect to maybe a very, very small part of yeah. the information. Okay, and one final question just before we pick up again. What if the document or the email doesn't have the actual data subject's name, but their initials? So Joe Blogs is JB. Phil, go for it. Okay, I would say it's completely dependent on the context. What is written, what, what information is there? Are they identifiable from it? If you go back to what is personal data, is it relating to the individual? Is it, does it identify them or could it identify, is it identifiable? So it would totally depend on the context. JB could be meaningless in that, con in, in a, in that context or it could actually identify the person depending on what it said. Yeah. As would chief executive as. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. 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 Or even yeah. a job title or could job identify title. you. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's just move on to the next questions we had in. Um, so when we're delivering something physically back and we're not extrapolating it into a spreadsheet or whatever, what do we what do we redact? Well, I, I think one of the things we touched on earlier, where there's third party information which we do not feel is, is something to be shared, either because of a balancing test or, um, you know, I've had a situation where an email that came in was marked private and confidential. Um, I think there's also the issue of confidential employee references as well. Mm -hmm. um, so as it's it's back to the usual thing of you know if you know why you've redacted it and what you've redacted and you've got a copy before redaction and after redaction if it then happens to go further through legal process and the judge says to you why did you redact that what did you redact and they decide to overturn that then you've got the before and after mm -hmm. version of it yeah and i was going to say i presume 
it's just not sensible if you took it logically that you redact absolutely everything in the document mm -hmm. other than that which is personal data that the individual is entitled to. So they just get blank pages yeah. with, that's just being sued, isn't it? Yeah, that starts okay. to look like one of those <laughs> FBI folders. Or okay. Okay. I think also it's important with the redaction, explain the redaction. Yes. Tell people what, you're, what you've done. In all of this, it's like, you know, be transparent, be open, be as open as you can and say, look, these are the emails we're providing you. We're providing you the emails where the content of them was about you. Mm -hmm. And this is what we've redacted, but we've redacted it for these reasons, yeah. because we are protecting mm -hmm. the, the interests of third parties and we have an obligation to do that. Yeah. You know, so, it, you know, being as clear and open about what you have and haven't done can only be a good thing. Yeah. I think it's also, uh, again, it's, I think it's common sense and, 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 and fairness. If you have a spreadsheet that's got 60 lines representing 60 people, um, you don't redact 59 lines and send the spreadsheet. You copy that one line and, and put it as a, let's put it in a separate document. Uh, and I think the same can be done very often with uh, emails. The, uh, the content, the personal information content can be taken out and just put it into a simple table. Uh, and that, that uh, um, yeah. uh, removes the need for redaction, uh, and which it, is hugely time consuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I know I've been reported on several occasions to the ICO by unhappy individuals because we've tended to use the table approach where we've said, here is the data on that date in that type of communication that was shared with for these purposes, and that's what you get. Mm -hmm. And I know it's minimalist, but you know, the ICO said that's what you're entitled to. It's not documents, it's the personal data that is held without you, etc. Um, okay, let's just jump on because of time on to the next one, which is um, how do you decide when a, a request is excessive? Is it about volume? Is it about complexity? What determines? It depends. Mm. <laughs> Apparently, Facebook. Uh, somebody received a Facebook request. It was three thousand pages. Um, I, I've actually come across one that was over two thousand pages personally. Um, if you've seen the film Erin Brockovich, um, <laughs> you will know that uh, burying your requester in piles and piles of paper is not necessarily uh, a transparent and fair way of, mm. of exercising their right. Right. And and let's suppose that we have got an individual that won't restricts the area of search, um, you've come to the conclusion this is this is somebody who is using the law for entirely the wrong reason. When do you think it's reasonable? How do you how do you prove disproportionate effort so that you can start charging money? Sarah? I think that's a tough one. Um, I haven't yet got into that position. I think you can often feel that a DSAR is, is coming at you for possibly questionable reasons, but at the end of the day, it is that data subject's right to yeah. ask for that. I think you have to be extremely careful about particularly putting in writing that you think a request is excessive. Um, I think you've got that, you've got the chance for a, you know, a communication between the two parties. And I think sometimes the fact that it comes through to the data protection officer is, is quite good because you can sometimes distance yourself from some of the other parties and departments who may have been involved um, and, and try and basically have a calm, as you said, common sense conversation about what is it that you want and why do you want it and, you know, we're here to help you. At the end of the day, you know, I, you know, a data protection officer works for the data subject. Mm. They do not work for the organisation. Um, yes, we're there to protect our organisations, but we're not there to stand in the way of the data subject's rights. So I think it is a balancing mm. act. Okay. I think so. it's it's important to to and there's case law from sort of late 2016, isn't there, that around a motive and basically. Uh, the, the, you know, you can't look at a data subject and go, oh, I'm not sure about their motive. I'm not going to comply about this. I think they've got a grievance procedure going against us or whatever. You can't use their motive as a, as, as a reason for, oh, this is a bit excessive or they're asking too much. It, it, it's purpose blind, basically. The access request is purpose blind. But I, I can well understand, you know, the, the business 
trying to look at this when they realized that th this is a big procedure. Mm -hmm. If you haven't automated the ability yep. to provide the individual with what they're entitled to, yeah, you've got a lot of searching to do. And it, it's, it is diverting people yep. from making profit. Yep. And of course, the individual in often cases well understands yeah. oh. and that's why they're doing it. Yeah. Um, I think if you if you get a situation where somebody continuously comes back and back and back and is questioning what you've delivered, particularly when you know you've delivered what you should have mm -hmm. delivered, and questioning the method of delivery, um, that you've delivered it and they still haven't looked at it, they still haven't opened it, they're still coming back and saying, well, I can't read it, I've only got this bit of equipment, I, ha I only go to the library once a week. I mean, you get all sorts of bits and bobs come back. Um, or they keep coming back and saying, well, now I want another one, now I want another one, it's yeah. these dates, I'm adding an extra month to it. Um, yeah. uh, then you do get into the realms of being able to sort of say, well, hang on a minute. This just is a quick one, Simon, and then we need yeah. to move on. Okay. I think yeah, the, the key point here is the word excessive really has to apply to the individual the requester's behaviour mm. and not to the amount of data or the effort required yeah. to recover. Okay, let's just move on. Um, so we know there are exemptions that there may be, we, we're not going to reveal information about it, third parties. We don't have to reveal information that's legally privileged. We don't necessarily have to reveal information if it might um, hamper current negotiations relating to compensation claim, etc. Also for forward forecasting and so on. Um, uh, again, how do you manage that in practice when you're telling individuals this is what we're giving you and why and by the way this is not what we're giving you thoughts go on Phil. I was, again I would go back to the point of being open and transparent mm -hmm. and explaining the reasons why you're relying on an on, on an exemption um, and documenting it behind the scenes to make sure that you've just, you've got a, a, a clear justification for why you're relying on 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 um, legal professional privilege for example mm. which again is very narrow isn't it in mm. how it can apply mm. I, I would agree I think uh, it's not going to happen very often um, the result is either going to be a complaint uh, to the ICO in which case the ICO will come to you and yep. you have to have documented your, yep. your rationale, uh, a defensible position. Um, the alternative is, of course, that you could actually contact the ICO and say, look, we believe this is the situation. Could you just give us some guidance? Yeah, and actually, that's a very good point. That I, I found the ICOs pre-GDPR as well to be very, very helpful when you go, can I just bounce this one yep. off you? Here is the situation. But I, I do think if you're going to rely on an exemption, and this is what most of these questions that we're looking at are focusing on, is you've got to be prepared to back up mm -hmm. your decision, which is why we're back to the documenting, why we're back to having a process that knows how to deal with it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And yes, we have had some where we've tactically not revealed everything and relied on one exemption or another, understanding that probably we may get pushed. But of course, if the individual accepts what you've given them, then from a business point of view, and I know Sarah is here to help the data subject, from the lawyer and the business point of view, you have delivered it. Okay, let's just turn to, and we're coming towards the end here. Um, just to remind, and we've sort of talked about this, that the, the more you are seen to help the individual, the more you can be transparent and open and willing and clear, I think the more likely the individual, whether they like, you know, they don't like what they receive because it hasn't revealed the smoking gun, there's not a lot else that they're going to be able to do. You have delivered the response to the SAR, and frankly, when we see things that go wrong, it is much better to, to make the person happy move on and do other things rather than have something going on and on and on because the risk is that the regulator will open the bonnet and take a look under the hood type of thing and so the more you can be helpful i think the better and if we just move on to the penultimate slide uh, I, have you found out there that there are any good tools to automate these sars 
Uh, yes, and I, 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 I won't name names because I haven't haven't looked too deeply into any of them. Uh, the, well, into many of them at this stage. But uh, yeah, there, there are there are certainly very useful tools. A number of them which will certainly run the uh, process, the logging and tracking, uh, and the timekeeping, um, which is which is a critical thing to do. They are very important to have, even if you only receive the occasional one, and they're not necessarily very expensive. If you are receiving a lot. You need to get into a specialist, not just a generally discovery tool. You need to get a specialist discovery tool, uh, which has got the search capabilities to analyze, preferably using AI uh, machine learning, to analyze the content of those emails to identify what is actually personal information and pull those 10 emails out of the 60,000 like that. But you still need human intervention to then go and look at the Of course, you, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. absolutely. Okay. And, okay. And, and then look at the last, so we talked about access and erasure. What if you subsequently discover that file in the bottom drawer or that stuff sitting at somebody's home? Um, is, is, do, you, do you still have to admit you missed something and send it out? Ask yourself, if you took this to your granny, took this question to your granny, what would she say? Yeah, send it out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, send admit, it out. Yeah. Say I'm sorry, admit yeah. your mistake. Yeah and be open. Yeah. I think the only caveat I'd put on that is if what you uncover <laughs> is just a duplicate of what you've already no. given them, yeah. then there is okay. no, no need. Yeah. Um, and, right. and sometimes yes. that will yeah. be a yes. backup or yeah. an archive. So. Yeah, and I, I, so two more questions. What happens if you don't respond in time? Well, you are probably going to have an individual that now can go one step further and write to the ICO and say, you have failed to meet my rights, etc. And Again, you know, the crisis then starts to become a disaster, etc. The last one on there is interesting. If you are uh, settling with an employee, can you can you put in there that part of the deal is you will not exercise your right? <laughs> should, we have a should we have a resounding answer on that one? <laughs> though, though I have I'd seen, like to see I have seen that happen. Great oh, to try. I have seen that happen. Really? Gosh, Why did I mean, they think that was a good thing? I know, yeah. I know, I know. So no, the answer to that is no. Um, <laughs> um, I, I yes. have one final question that came in, um, and I apologise to others that are zooming in as I'm speaking, but right at the beginning, somebody said, how does the data subject apply to the court to exercise their right? And, and that's a good one, because we're all looking at each other and thinking, well, if you go to the ICO, don't you? To say my right has, you know, I have tried to exercise my right, it's not being complied with, I'm complaining to the ICO. Somebody is saying, what do I do to go to court to get my rights responded to? I presume you can hire a lawyer. Yeah, to, and I suppose you're going to actually say, I'm going for compensation now. I imagine the emotional distress that I've suffered as well with you not complying with my rights remembering that not complying with data subjects rights is one of those maximum 4% mm. type situations. So yeah, go go talk to a good lawyer about, about that one. <laughs> yeah, um, don't expect 4%. <laughs> we started late, I apologize to those of you who are still on the call and we, we have gone over the uh, allotted uh, time of finishing at five. So I am gonna wind up at this point. Um, we got through the compilation of the questions. Um, so thank you for, to Phil particularly for helping compile those. Thanks to you that um, on the call sent the questions in. If there are any questions that you still have, by all means send them in to us and we can uh, circulate those amongst the panelists uh, for your answers. Uh, as I said at the start, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available for download um, next week. Uh, we haven't planned yet a webinar for next year, um, so having just gone past Thanksgiving for our US audience and to those of us who are heading towards uh, the uh, next festive um, period, uh, from all of us on the call here, uh, thank you. Uh, have a good festive period and we look forward to being with you on another occasion. Thank you.